Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2, verse 32. Acts chapter 2, actually let's start at verse 36. Acts 2, 36. The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you as a believer priest the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. So if we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher, and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. So with that in mind, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and freedom to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning your word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and give us the concentration necessary to assimilate this portion of the word of God into our stream of consciousness. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Acts 2.36 states, Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Now this is obviously Peter speaking to the Jews who did reject Christ and he is berating them. He says, whom you crucified and that really got under their skin. But Peter knows now and he has grown a lot uh, since the day of Pentecost. It, it is that day. He's grown a lot on that day. And the principle is it's very important to understand we, when to be dogmatic. And you have to be dogmatic, especially when dealing with a hostile audience, especially when dealing with a hostile audience. A lot of times people want to compromise if they're dealing with a hostile audience, but actually you're to turn the heat up a notch or two. So it's imperative to be dogmatic, especially when dealing with a hostile audience. You've got to establish what is the authority. And what is the authority? Well, Peter is the authority. But why is he the authority? The word of God. That's why. Now there's many things in life. That in which a person should be flexible. Actually most things in life. You should be flexible. In terms of your environment. Uh, courtesy towards other. Etc. When it, but when it comes to a spiritual gift. As Peter has. The gift of apostleship. In terms of a spiritual gift. And especially in terms of giving the gospel. You must be dogmatic. You can't be wishy-washy. You must be dogmatic. And that's how Peter comes across for once. And again, there are many things in life in which you should be flexible, and yet you may be dogmatic. For example, if you go to the drive-thru and you order something and they get the order a bit wrong, well, that's... Uh, People get more angry over that than someone uh, being hostile to doctrine. So you have to learn to be flexible with those type, menial, trivial things. Be flexible that way. That ensures uh, that you will stay away from arrogance. But be inflexible when it comes to Bible doctrine. For the Word of God is definitely one of those things in which you should not be flexible. The principle is that truth requires dogmatism. And the reason why is because there's a lot more false concepts going around than truth. All you have to do is turn on the news. And there's so much craziness and false ideas, false notions of socialism, uh, people with their silly opinions based on the superficial, all of which is related to a country's decline and the fact that there are false concepts in the land which may become a cancer to the land and individually to your soul, your, your soul will be eaten up with scar tissue. So truth requires dogmatism. And truth related to God is not merely veracity toward other persons, but God is actually true to himself. He's true to his own essence. He is true to his own character. That's why the Lord had to go to the cross. If there could have been any other way, it would have been created. The only way for our salvation is the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other name given under heaven among men by which man can be saved. So truth is not merely veracity toward other persons, but God is true to himself, his own essence, his own character. Man says, I speak the truth. 
God says, I am the truth. I remember when I was, uh, I got the privilege to eat lunch with the colonel along with some other people that were invited. And he was talking about one subject related to the Bible. And there had, there would happen to be some controver controversy related to it. But I remember clearly, I won't go into what, what was being said, but I remember clearly him making sure that he was very dogmatic when it came to the Word of God. However, other things require flexibility. So man says, I speak the truth, but God says, I am the truth. You don't see anybody running around who has a normal personality and who are normal. No one runs around and says, I am the truth. I am the truth. There are a few nutcases that run around and do that. And I met one guy. He said, I am Rick Knapp's church, whatever that meant. It's weird. You listen to it if you're a member of the congregation. Well, that guy was just a weirdo. It just popped into my mind going over this. because He said, I am the Tetelestai Church. What? You, you are? <laughs> oh, well. Well, only God can say, I am the truth. And that's found in John 14, verse 6. Now, we acquire truth. That is, we do as human beings, as those who are positive toward the Word of God, we acquire truth. God doesn't acquire truth. He is truth. He does not obtain truth. He always was truth. He doesn't have to acquire it. God was truth in eternity past. And in God, every truth is in every form of knowledge, and it dwells in an absolute sense. It's an absolute there are very th few things in life that are absolutes. And we call certain things in science an absolute, but they're only an absolute because God made it so, such as gravity. You hear, what comes up must go down. And that's an absolute related to gravity, but there would be no gravity without God. So the accounts for the dogmatism of the truth, of the Word of God, is found all throughout Scripture. And here happens to be one of them where Peter makes a very dogmatic statement which insults the religious type. The religious type people, the legalistic type in the church are the easiest to offend. They're looking to be offended. It makes them feel better about themselves. So this attribute guarantees the genuine uh, the genuine uh, aspects of divine revelation. It's genuine. Bible doctrine or truth is the expression of God's integrity. So when you learn Bible doctrine, you're learning about God's integrity. For Bible doctrine is an expression of his integrity. That's found in Hebrews 8 too. God's truth is directed toward himself. And it is revealed to us. Now this all sounds uh, theological, and it is. What do, what do I mean when I say God's truth is directed toward himself? That has to deal with God's very own spiritual self-esteem. And that, that's, the only, that's the closest I can get to describing what God has. He has this for himself. God's truth is directed toward, him, toward himself on the basis of his own integrity. And so that means God is never unfaithful to himself. And as a result, he's not unfaithful to you. And as an aside for your relationships, ladies like to make uh, application to relationship. Uh, when you enter into a relationship with someone, romance, friendship, marriage, you have to have something directed towards self to have your own integrity intact. And oftentimes in a relationship you're, sub, you're focusing on the object of admiration but you always have to relate it to yourself who and what you are and if you have Bible doctrine you have the potential for good relationships and to be wise in the picking of it but not always but the principle is God is never unfaithful to himself and that means he's never unfaithful to you people will be the world will be God never will be verse 37 when the people heard this, the religious Jews, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? This caused great consternation. 
just those few words that Peter spoke. And you can see that it cut them. And he actually uses those words. What does this mean? It means that the word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. So there's an importance to Bible doctrine, of course. And there must be a dogmatism related to it for those with the spiritual gift. And when you witness, there, now you have your own personality when you witness. And while you might not sound dogmatic, you must be very firm in what you're stating. And the best way to do it is to quote some verses. Keep, keep the conversation on track. I witnessed to one guy, he kept wanting to go off in the Thule's about matters that he would never understand because he was not a believer. So you had to keep it fairly simple such as Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. He had the idea that he was a good person and that would get him to heaven. So I quoted Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. It is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So any time he would come around to how great he was, I would quote that verse. And then when he would say, well, shouldn't there be another means of salvation? I would say... There's no other name under heaven given among men by which man can be saved except the Lord Jesus Christ. So I kept hitting that home, and then God the Holy Spirit had to deal with him in whatever way uh, to, make, to create a response, either positive or negative. So doctrine is important, and that's what actually comes out in verses 36 and 37 and following. We're going to see some other things about how they go to Bible class daily. That's in, in Acts that we'll be going over. And so we have the importance of Bible doctrine. And doctrine is important because it's related to the attributes of God. Doctrine is the basis for all of your worship and the basis for all true worship, even when we have a song service. I've practiced the guitar enough now to where maybe tomorrow morning I'll be, I won't do it for you guys listening on the Internet. I don't want to harm you with that. But I'll do it here. And... Um, I'll play the chords, and then you can sing along. It'll be different. So doctrine is the basis for all true worship. Psalm, Psalms 138.2 I myself will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your grace and your doctrine. For you have magnified your doctrine above your person. Now, when you go to a holy roller church, I hope you don't, but if you've had occasion to visit one, I'm sure most people have, Praising the Lord is something they want to do or say they're doing or they shout constantly. Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord! Oh, and then they try to outdo each other and get louder and louder until it sounds like a big mess. But praising the Lord is not saying it in a sim simple, hollow phrase. Saying that you're praising the Lord doesn't mean you're doing that at all. In fact, you could be doing the exact opposite. You could be anathema maranatha. So the only way you can apply doctrine is to put doctrine first in your life. And people will have to run around with a facade and say, Praise the Lord, hallelujah, amen, bless you sister, bless you brother. People like that don't have anything in their soul. And it shows a bunch of ignorance. And they're trying to make up for their ignorance by using hollow, super, superficial phraseology. English language. Hollow English language that has no meaning. Running around shouting praise God means nothing. Or as I saw on one church sign, it says, "Staying in." It said this, which it, it's a funny church sign actually. It says, "Staying in bed, shouting, oh God, does not constitute going to church." Well, that's true. I don't know what they what point they were trying to make, but that, that's true. J just simple using a phraseology does not mean you are spiritual. Opening your mouth with your and wagging that tongue does not make you spiritual whatsoever. The type of language you use does not make you spiritual. Luke twenty three forty six states, Into your hands I deposit my spirit. But then we learn also from Psalm 31, 5, For you have delivered me, O Lord, God of doctrine. And in fact, while it's not recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it is recorded in Psalm 31 5 the last words of our Lord three words God of doctrine 
It's the last phrase our Lord spoke before he departed this earth. So therefore you note the importance of Bible doctrine. Romans 3, 3 through 4. Shall their unbelief cancel the faithfulness of God? Definitely not. Moreover, let God continue faithful, even though every man is a liar, even as it stands written, and this is a quotation of Psalms 51, 4, that you might be vindicated by your doctrine, and that you might prevail when you are maligned. Actually, Psalms 51, 4 is a prophecy of what the Lord Jesus Christ will do. So it would read this way to understand it. That Jesus Christ might be vindicated by his doctrine and that he might prevail when he is maligned. And he was maligned more than any person ever in all of history. And he was perfect. Now God only deals with us in truth and Bible doctrine. That's why it should be number one priority. All faithfulness is based on the truth, so your perception, metabolization, and application of truth of Bible doctrine indicates your spiritual growth, not how much you sin or how little you sin, etc. Though the, the amount of time you spend in sin will decrease as you grow spiritually, you'll never become perfect ever until you die or until the resurrection of the church. You're always going to sin. In fact, Moses having gone all the way to Jeshurun, got to the point he almost died the sin unto death after reaching Jeshurun. And he actually coined the word Jeshurun. So we, we are imperfect all of our lives in this body. Therefore, the important thing is Bible doctrine, that you might prevail when you are maligned, and that uh, our Lord tested that to the maximum. So God only deals with us in truth. Principle. God only deals with us in truth. All faithfulness is based upon truth. God always levels with us, and God will always tell us the truth. We, not, might, we might not like it when something is leveled against us from the pulpit, but take it as from unto the Lord, or take it as unto the Lord. Now, you can malign Bible doctrine, and a lot of people do, especially nowadays during these extreme times of apostasy in this country and around, a wor around the world. But there has always been uh, a maligning of the truth. You can malign it all you want, but you will never destroy the truth. Now, Bible doctrine is maligned in two ways. First of all, by distortion, and secondly, by ignorance. Number, the number one, by distortion, you could consider that as cosmic too. These are people antagonistic toward the word of God, antagonistic toward the gospel. They want to distort the gospel into a system of works instead of faith alone and Christ alone. They want to distort Bible teaching from a teaching of grace plus Bible doctrine and all of the aspects of the spiritual skills, the spiritual mechanics, the ten problem solving devices, and distort it into a teaching against certain sins that they don't like. And that's all you'll get today at any Baptist church or in most churches around the country. They'll harp on one certain sin or two or three that they don't like. And if you don't commit those sins that they don't like, then, well, you're all right in their eyes. But they're involved in the worst of sinning. In fact, they're involved in wrongdoing because they've distorted the word of God. They don't even know what grace is all about. Then there's ignorance, number two. With distortion definitely comes ignorance. But ignorance of Bible doctrine always leads to a stupid supposition that sin is the great issue. Sin was dealt with at the cross. It is a great issue. It was dealt with on the cross. Now when you believe in Christ, all your pre-salvation sins are forgiven. And when you rebound as a believer, all of your sins up until that point are forgiven. Ignorance of this doctrine leads to criticism of someone for their area of weakness, which is not anyone's business. So Bible doctrine is the content of the Bible. What should matter to you is how much Bible doctrine do you have in your soul? What content of Bible doctrine do you have in your soul? Now somebody who doesn't understand grace will hear this and say, he's not emphasizing sin enough. Look, if you sin, you go out of fellowship and you will be punished. But all you need to do is rebound and keep moving. And I get this from Scripture. Press on toward the upward call of God. Disregarding those things that are behind. What are those things that are behind? Your sins. Your wrongdoing. Stuff that you do that you don't even know is wrong. 
You get involved in some environmentalist movement. You get involved in some socialist movement. You're in wrongdoing. You're trying to whitewash the devil's world. And that definitely shows an ignorance of Bible doctrine. Yet believers do it all the time. Bible doctrine is the content of the Bible. Now it has to be communicated. That's why there's the gift of pastor-teacher. And there must be a teaching and instruction type setting. It's a communication of Bible doctrine that, uh, puts, uh, that is based upon an analysis from Scripture. And we have a an analysis and an excuse me and we have a, an analysis related to the context of the scripture, the classification of certain subjects, uh, that would be categorization. Also, isagogic's understanding the word of God it, during the time in which it was written. So, Bible doctrine is the written permanent expression of God's integrity to the human race. It's the verbalization of God's divine justice. That was uh, of, of divine justice. Doctrine is the study of the attributes of God. Psalms 33, verse 4. For the word of doctrine, or the word of God, is the, is, uh, the study of the word of God. It, is, it focuses on the Lord as the integrity and all the provision that he's given to us in his faithfulness. There's nomenclature related to the importance of Bible doctrine. But I won't go over that now. We will continue with uh, some of the other aspects <coughs> of what we were going to study. We may go back once we get to uh, another verse. <coughs> so they asked them what to do. Back to Acts now. Acts chapter 2 verse 37. They asked Peter and the others there, well what should we do? because they had just been condemned, now what should they do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized. And a lot of people would confuse this because they do not understand dispensations. In the pre-canon era, and this is the pre-canon era, the Bible had not yet been written. Not one jot or tittle had been written, that is in the New Testament. And so none of this existed for them to learn about the unique spiritual life. But repent is the focus of repent is to the Jews, and that's because they had been exposed to our Lord's ministry over a three year period, and during that time they simply rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. What did they do? They said no to the gospel when it was taught, when our Lord taught it. And they continued to say no up until this point. And so they asked Peter what to do. Now when since he's talking to Jews, he's going to have to say repent. Change your mind. That's what repent means. Metanoiao in the Greek. It means to change your mind. So P Peter replied, change your mind. And he must give it this way because he's dealing with Jews who had already made up their mind concerning Christ. They'd already said no. Now, now when you deal with the Gentiles in the book of John especially, you don't see John saying repent. Why? He's dealing with Gentiles. They don't need to change their mind. They simply need to believe. They had not heard of the Lord. The Jews had heard of him all their life. So the only thing they can do is change their mind, which is tantamount to believing. They were in disbelief. When they repent, it goes to belief. It is a change of mind. First they didn't believe in Christ, then they will believe in Christ and be baptized. And they are actually referencing the ritual baptism and that's part of the Bible teaching of that time, the pre-canon era. Today, water baptism is discouraged. Now, you may have had it done, and you may have done it in ignorance, or you may not have been ignorant and had your head dunked under water. Uh, either way, uh, it doesn't matter because, well, it does matter to an extent that the Apostle Paul discouraged such activity because it becomes a distraction, and we live in a dispensation in which it's not needed. But if it was done, so what? When I lived in South Carolina, the neighborhood kids would come over and they would say, and they would get in the pool while we were swimming and they would come over and say, we want to be baptized. So I would do it just for the fun of it. And they, they were just, you know, playing around. But it really has no meaning for us today. It is not commanded for us. The only ritual extant today uh, would be the ritual of communion, which we'll have to have at some point. 
But Peter replied, change your mind and be baptized, every one of you. To be, and then he says, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. When you believe in Christ, all of your pre-salvation sins are wiped out. And you will receive the gift of God the Holy Spirit. And so there's baptism related to that as well. I'm not going to go over the seven different um, meanings of baptism today. That might be a subject for tomorrow. So repent and be baptized. And there are seven different types, and we'll get it all straightened out tomorrow. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And notice when a person receives the Holy Spirit, it's the same then as it is now. When you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you receive the filling of God the Holy Spirit, and the same was happening at this point in time, this, the time period which we're studying, when the church first got on its feet. So that knocks out all the holy roller type activity of a second blessing. You receive the Holy Spirit the moment you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 39, the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. For all whom the Lord our God will call. Who are the people that are far off? We are. They didn't even know America existed back then. But we do. We do now. So we would be considered those far off people in Peter's mind. But this is the concentration of believers is now in this hemisphere. Quite interesting. Europe's in the Western Hemisphere too, but you know what I mean in this area. Verse 40. With many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. A generation of apostasy is a generation negative toward the gospel, followed by negative volition toward the word of God in general after salvation. Verse 41. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Now how what, did this occur? Did this occur by Peter making some emotional type connection with his audience? Did it occur because he started to speak in a certain way? Uh, that if you don't come to Christ, uh, and he didn't, he didn't do it by patting them on the back and saying, Oh, you good people of Jerusalem. Oh, you come to and be saved. Listen to my message. Oh, you wonderful people. He didn't get them that way. How'd he get them? He said, You crucified the person who will give you your salvation. And that's how he did it. And then God the Holy Spirit went to work and over 3,000 were saved. So you can see that a dogmatic message is the one that works. 3,000, that's quite a number for one day. Verse 42, they devoted themselves. Now what happens? Well, they've believed in Christ and all those who are with the apostles. This is what they're going to do, including and especially the apostles. Verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. That is fellowship with God. To the breaking of bread and to prayer. They did a communion service and they, were, they learned how to pray. All of this, was, there was a lot of ritual in those times because they did not have the Bible. But not only that, that, they did have the Torah, but they didn't have any of the New Testament. And not only that, a lot of people could not read in those days. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Now this is pre-canon era, and you have to understand how to rightly divide the word of truth. During this time, since there is no New Testament, since there is no instruction on the Musterion doctrine, the mystery doctrines, there are a lot of rituals that occur, and also signs and wonders that our Lord would allow as a credit card to the apostles. And this is how you could uh, look at it. How are you going to know if someone has authority concerning the word of God? Well, there's no Bible to look at to compare and contrast. What do they do? They use miracles, a lesser form. It's inferior. A lot of people are dazzled by miracles, but it's an inferior form of communication. But it was used as communication to teach to let them know that the people in charge were the apostles. 
And in this case, the Apostle Peter was in charge. So God gave the Apostle Peter a credit card of authority. How are they going to know that Peter is right? Because he will be the only one able to perform these miracles related to God the Holy Spirit performing the miracles on Peter's behalf. Verse 44, All the believers were gathered together and had everything in common, a commune. But this is not really what it means. It's not a commune at all. They just decided that since the church is under persecution, they decided to split their money up. There would be some wealthy people, and they would give up everything, and then there would be the poorer people who would be helped. And you would say, that sounds like socialism. No. And I'll tell you why. Socialism is forced. This is all based upon the charity, free will, they freely decided to give a large hunk to the ministry. Freely. It's their money. It's their property. They could keep it if they wanted. But they all decided to take everything and put it in common. And the reason why is because Christianity was under attack in those days. And if there were a, a poor person in the congregation, they would much more easily be taken advantage of than someone like Paul who was not only aristocrat, but a Roman citizen as well. So they wanted to make sure that uh, everyone was taken care of so that they could focus on what? Bible doctrine. Because when Peter will start teaching, and we'll see this, they will meet every day, and they will continue in their meetings and in prayer, not just one hour a day every day, we're talking Bible doctrine marathons from 8 in the morning all the way up until midnight at night. And if Paul were around, it goes on past midnight every single day. So, well, when you're getting that kind of doctrine, how are you going to go out and uh, work and provide for yourself, etc.? Well, of course, people still had their jobs, but... For those who were poor, they'd have to work all the time, but now they put everything in common to where they can all attend Bible class and not worry about their finances. They came to agreement on this, so this isn't a force type thing. And no, Peter did not come up and say, I've got an idea. Everybody put your money in this pot and we'll call it the church's money. No, it just happened that way. They were all in agreement that this is what's going to happen. And if someone disagreed, they just left the church. But they were all in agreement because they understood the importance of what was happening. <clears throat> so in verse 43, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders. Verse 44, all the believers had everything in common. Verse 45, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. They wanted to make sure that, any, that anyone who had need for Bible doctrine would not have to worry about the needs of their family so they could concentrate fully on Bible doctrine. Verse 46, every day, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, they did the Eucharist, and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Sincere is not the word, it just simply means everyone at this time was positive toward the word of God, at least toward the gospel at first. Then in verse 47, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. There would be people who would come along and listen to the message, and they too would be saved. But I want you to notice something. You might want to underline it in verse 47. And the Lord added to their number a lot of people like to make a big deal out of numbers, but it's the Lord who adds the people. And there has to be positive volition for it to occur. There seems to be very, very little in these United States. But the Lord adds to the number. Not They gave the gospel, of course, but it was the Lord who adds to the number. We are helpless outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, my throat's a little dry, so I'm going to wrap it up early. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and challenge us concerning this portion of the Word of God. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.